One thing I always ask my Learning Hack guests is where they find their learning inspiration. The Learning Technologies Exhibition and Conference in London is a frequent answer. Celebrating its 25th year, it's been a key source of knowledge for me personally, bringing together the best in global learning. With some 10,000 attendees expected and more than 200 free floor seminars, it's a must-go-to show. Join us in London on April the 17th and 18th. Register now at learningtechnologies.co.uk. learningtechnologies.co.uk. Hold it right there. If you're not the sort of person who enjoys lively conversations about the history of learning theory, if names like Socrates, Hegel, Havelock leave you cold, then maybe this one isn't for you. But if you are that person, women and men, we give you Leonard Hooks. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies creating the future of learning. I'm John Hellman. Now guess what? Learning is learning cool. Is cool. cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning. I'm learning. Learning is fun. And knowledge is power. Knowledge is kish. Sadly, this season of The Learning Hack is coming to an end. The good news is, well, two bits of good news, really. Firstly, we'll be back in September. And secondly, we're about to kick off a new season of our sister podcast, Great Minds on Learning. By way of a sort of handover, we invited along a friend of The Learning Hack, Leonard Hooks, who we featured way back in 2020. Leonard told me that he's a fan of Great Minds on Learning and has some reflections about the series to share with us. But first of all, Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact. Who is he? Hack Facts. Leonard Hooks is an award-winning director of learning design, currently at the Cambridge Education Group and previously at Bayes Business School. Leonard studied at the University of Portland and at an Orthodox Theological Seminary in New York, as well as Columbia University and City University in London. Leonard's response to what Donald Clark and I have been doing with Great Minds on Learning comes out of his own deep engagement with many of the thinkers and ideas we've covered over the 30 episodes so far. But he wanted to zero in on two areas in particular, the Greeks, who we covered in episode 12, and the German idealists from episode 26. I make no apologies for going long and deep on this one. It might seem a bit academic to some, but I have to trust that other people will find the conversation as fascinating as I did myself. And I have to say that as a podcaster, it's just amazing to have listeners as engaged and as knowledgeable as Leonard and the rest of you as well. Hi, Leonard. It's great to have you on the podcast again. Welcome back. Thanks. It's almost four years since you were last on, on with us, talking about learning design theory and skateboarding. It was after that conversation, and partly because of that conversation, in fact, that I started up our sister podcast, Great Minds on Learning, with Donald Clark. Um, obviously, Donald uh, had, has read absolutely everything about learning theory and, and, and was there with this whole horde of blog posts that we could use to get going on. But I think my conversation with you did start up an interest in where instructional design comes from and the theory and so on. So now we're on to our sixth season of G me and Donald. And I know you've been following the podcast during all that time. Uh, and we've discussed you doing a response to it. Um, I know you've got a couple of things in particular you want to talk about today, the Greeks and the Germans. So that can form the spine of a structure here. It's a bit freewheeling apart from that. But before we get into that, can I first of all get your general views about the podcast series, Great Minds on Learning, um, and, you know, you don't have to blow smoke. Um, so in the vein, perhaps, of insights and oversights, what, what's it been getting right? What's it kind of missing out on, maybe? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess first let me say about the, the phrase insights and oversights, which I, I think I mentioned to you. Um, it's a phrase that I, I really love. Um, it's from a book actually from an American philosopher named Charles Hartshorn. Uh, and, and he wrote this book called Insights and Oversights of Great Thinkers. And I, um, it took me probably about 20 years from hearing about the book to actually reading it. 
But I just love this title because, I mean, it held so much promise that, you know, and it's just, it's like so delightfully pretentious. Like this guy is basically going to look at the history of philosophy and straighten everybody out, you know, and um, it kind of, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to play on like trying to use like whatever, I don't know, to overly youthful analogies, but it does sort of remind me of, um, my son has been getting into listening to 50 Cent and he asked me the other day, like, oh, what's your favorite 50 Cent song? And I lived in New York when 50 Cent came out and he had this song called How I Rob. And the whole song was just basically about how he went through a catalog of everyone in the rap and R&B industry and described how he was going to rob them. And uh, he just like, he just basically started off his career, you know, pissing off everybody. And in a way, it's almost like the, yeah, Charles Hartshorn is kind of, you know, like I kind of imagined his book was like that. And then I read it and it was the most tiresome. It was such a disappointment. It was, it was so tedious. And it was, I guess, in a way, like what you might think it was like, where, you know, he's going, going well, um, you know, Spinoza was good here because he agrees with me, but here he doesn't agree with me and that's not so good. And there was like no real kind of critique. It was, it was pretty dull. And I spent, you know, I, I, I spent like my holiday with friends in Provence, you know, by the swimming pool reading this terrible book. Anyway, so that's insights and oversights. The other kind of idea I had about like a name for this, the podcast was more of a comment than a question because that's also kind of how I feel about talking about, you know, Donald Clark's virtuoso performance of, you know, the, the history of thought related to education is that I'm this uh, kind of belligerent mansplainer, you know, who's kind of arrogantly, you know, coming in, but which is only just to say, you know, who am I to comment you know, on, uh, you know, this, this really incredible series that, that you and, and Donald have done. Um, now, what do I think about it? Um, I, I think it's been amazing. Uh, I think that it's, to my mind, it's like so much what the world of learning and L and D and really ed tech, all of it, um, sorely lacks. It's it's what we need so much, and we're constantly in this cycle of the, um, you know, this this kind of horrible, vicious cycle of announcing a new revolution, a new idea. When you know we're like the most edu people in education generally, the most likely to to claim to be introducing a new idea, and the least likely to know whether it's actually a new idea or not. And so, you know, taking this step backwards and, and kind of looking at the, the a, a big view of the landscape is, is so salutary. And, I, and when I say that too, I should say, I am not just talking about the world of podcasts or blogs or conferences, but, but the educational research, you know, it, it's, it's really surprisingly often that you, you, you read in the educational research, you know, you, you see this profound lack of like a strong background or, or good, you know, literature reviews. Um, so the, the second reason I should say that I love it is because it is so contrary, you know, um, and, and I don't, I, I, you know, it's not like the kind of not talking about, you know, people who like to argue or stage controversies, because I think there's a lot of that in, in the learning world where it happens on a kind of um, shallow level, but, but where, you know, you see the room, you read the room and the mood, and then you just do something completely different. And, you know, I feel like this is, you know, this is your punk moment, John, you know, that you're <laughs> like, you know, well, you, I've already like, had you, one of those. It's yeah. You, you've kind of seen another Yeah. One. You already had one, I guess. Yeah. This is your, your, uh, your punk Renaissance, you know, but uh, um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and I guess the last thing is just that I, I do, I do love theory. And so, um, getting to, to hear Donald 
so um, fluently talk through all these topics is, is a great pleasure. So that's great to hear, glowing with pride, um, uh, slightly teary-eyed. Um, <laughs> So before we kind of, you know, get to be wallowing in sentimentality about how, how wonderful we all are, um, perhaps we should dive in. So you wanted, first of all, to talk about the Greeks. Let's start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. Of course, they, they weren't the beginning because they were the pre-Socratics. But so Donald and I did an episode about Greeks in season two, which at, at the time was the furthest back that we had gone. I have to say, in the upcoming season, we're going back further than that to the birth of writing. Um, and you told me you have things you'd like to raise on that topic. So this is interesting to me because we're formulating the next season. We're going to go back to the birth of writing. And you want us to talk about Homer as the original curriculum. And I really don't know how to pronounce this. Chiron or Chiron as the original teacher. I think it's Chiron. Teacher. Yeah. Chiron, and yeah. So, yeah. And yeah. Chiron's, a, Chiron's a centaur. Which is the first on the podcast to have a, a you know half human half beast um, mythical creature rather than some kind of um, crusty old German. <laughs> um, although we've got plenty of those, uh, and then the sophists, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Havelock's thesis about Socrates and slavery in the Greek Empire. I mean, there's a lot to cover there. I'm I'm not sure we're going to get through all of that, but would you like to kind of? Um, kick off maybe maybe we yeah so so maybe run kind of scattershot here but yeah um yeah so um you and donald talked about um socrates and and plato and aristotle and so forth and i think what might be helpful is to maybe set the stage a bit for how you know how radical the the the, the change that um you know that was happening in Greece really was that uh, you know uh, Plato and Socrates were really you know at the at the forefront of or at the kind of doing it maybe the, the most <laughs> um, and so you know um, before basically uh, the uh, the advent of the kind of the proper uh, Greek alphabet um, and uh, and literacy in in Greece. The the ancient Greek curriculum, I, I think, first of all, was entirely an elite phenomenon. It was you know it was for uh, you know the the aristocracy, and it was comprised of um, sport. Uh, poetry and and art so typically uh, a school would have sport in the morning and then and then poetry and then poetry was musical so it had uh, a kind of um, harp or you know musical accompaniment that would um, uh, accompany the poetry so it, would, it was more like singing and then sometimes there would be art sometimes sometimes not and the poetry this is the important bit the poetry was largely Homer, and um, the, the basically the learning of the pro of the poetry was just a process of just memorizing it. And poetry was really like the kind of the the information system of the time. Um, you know, they didn't you know not having books. Um, rhyming verse was the way that information was was stored, and um, so poetry was was kind of they a lot was put on poetry. There was a lot that they tried to do with poetry. So um, poetry uh, told uh, histories, you know. So much of you know through the, there were sagas. Some uh, Greek scholars think that some of the ancient myths were actually. Um, ways of telling history. They were kind of historical allegories. Um, there were catalogs within the poetry. So, you know, when you read the Iliad, there is like a catalog of types of sailing ships that, that are listed. Mm. But that's an extremely boring chapter of the Iliad. It has to be said, yeah, the yeah. list of Yeah, list and, of and yeah, maybe yeah. hard to memorize, but um but most importantly, um it was how they taught virtue or, or arete. And uh, 
the the you know the young student was meant to identify you know it was it, they learned virtue through um identifying or not identifying with with the, the heroes of these stories with you know achilles bravery or odysseus's cleverness and um and and so uh that's just almost like what it meant to be clever so um there's i have a quote from uh and and this is a reflection this is the point is that it was a reflection of a, an oral culture um so uh, neil postman you know talking about um the biblical you know ancient near east culture uh he has this quote about Solomon where he says, you know, the wise Solomon, we are told in First Kings, knew 3,000 proverbs. And, you know, he says, in a print culture, people with such a talent are thought to be quaint at best, more likely pompous bores. Uh, but in an oral culture, uh, a high value is always placed on the power to memorize. For where there are no written words, the human mind must function as a mobile library. And... Um, so, so yeah, so memorization and then identification. And um, yeah, there's more to say about identification, but maybe for a moment, I'll jump to Kieran, the original hero uh, teacher. So Kieran um, was in, in the Iliad, he was a, a mentor teacher to Achilles mm -hmm. and he was a centaur and I, they, um, the, Achilles's parents gave Achilles, you know, he was, he was raised by Chiron. He was, they, I think the word they use is reared by um, Chiron and taught uh, martial skills. He was taught fighting with weapons and hunting and archery. He was taught music as, as was part of the, this Homeric curriculum. Um, he was, it says he was taught some medicine and he was a kind of, also a sort of a father figure. So they say that I think he reared him with love. And uh, um, and and so, yeah, to me, this is just amazing. You can see this in, um, there's, there's some uh, ancient like Greek pots where you can see, you know, uh, Achilles' mother handing Achilles to, to Chiron, the, the centaur. And he's a kind of an aged centaur. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, in a way, I, I think initially, you, you know, I was like saying this to my wife, like, yeah, did you know that, you know, Achilles is meant to have been taught by a centaur? And she's like, well, she didn't seem that blown away. I was like, she, <laughs> she, she was like, well, yeah, you know, I mean, like, it's like you want to, um, it's like an image of kind of the, the ultimate, you know, kind of teacher. He's like, and um, so even in some versions, um, uh, Kieran is omniscient, you know, he's like, he's sort of everything. And we see this kind of, I don't know, this kind of archetype handed down, like, in, you know, uh, I think of like Yoda or, you know, um, yeah. Morpheus in, in the Matrix or Professor Dumbledore, you know, this person who is uh, otherworldly in their uh, their great, their great knowledge. Anyway, so that was um, <clears throat> Kieran, but back to the, the Homeric curriculum and, and what this break was. And Havelock, uh, who's a, a classicist, has this uh, kind of thesis about about what was going on, and and that part of what was um, you know the, the the change that happened involved a kind of epistemological break where it's as he puts there was a for the first time a separation of the knower and of the known and i think this has a huge amount of import and should be very thought-provoking for you know people who work in education particularly in online education um so you know havelock will say you know the iliad and odyssey were you know, they worked on a system of memory. Um, this was the culture's information system. And that because everything was in, in this kind of system of, of identifications, 
um, what and and what was lacking, what you don't see when you read the Iliad is a sense of self. There wasn't a, a language of self. So Achilles is 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 you know full of of personality and of vigor and decision making, but he isn't like a person who kind of sees himself as a self, you know, has like uh, where, you know, his, um, uh, his, there's an ego, there's an I that's like the, the seat of, of decision-making. So what Plato was doing, and this is part of what, why, as, as you guys talked about, why Plato really had a problem with, with poetry is, is that, um, there needed to be this uh, this kind of a break where he was introducing, in a sense, two two things in the separation of noor and known. The first was this concept of a psyche, um, and the word psyche already existed, but what, but it, but its meaning changed, and um, to to kind of go from being um, to go from being like a just a, a kind of a ghost or wraith, ghostly life force to being a ghost that thinks. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that Donald would say that, um, you know, point out that this is the beginning perhaps of a kind of Cartesian dualism and, and this kind of really unnecessary concept of, as Gilbert Ryle said, the ghost in the machine. Yeah. But I think there's something more fundamental going on where it's really trying to on a more basic level establish a sense of self of, of the individual um and and so that's the one thing and then on the other hand there's an idea of of knowledge um as independent from individual people and you see this i, I suppose especially in in socrates where by his his method of questioning and his kind of tropes of humility of you know not knowing anything you know he's he's trying to say that um yeah knowledge doesn't belong to anyone truth doesn't belong to anyone you know i mean this is going into the biblical world but you know king solomon had memorized all these words and he was rich and he had so many wives but you know um and so and so he was considered the wisest man you know, in, in the world at that point from their perspective. But, you know, from Socrates' perspective, truth is just truth. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, when when you're saying something true. Either it's it's true or it's it's not. And um, you know, as as we kind of in the online learning world work in a in a space where uh you know um sometimes that connection between the, the, the persona who's, you know, offering the truth or, you know, the learning and um, the information, sometimes they can, they can get sort of decoupled or merged and put together in, in um, different ways because of how we manage the process. Um, it's, a, it's a really, uh, to, to my mind, a really important idea. Um, yeah, and we, what we're talking about here is the separation of content from the human contact, you know, the, the, the relationship between a teacher and a pupil and the relationship between that pupil and content, which is encoded knowledge. And is what you're saying here to play that back, that where, where we get this kind of handover from an oral culture where um, knowledge is contained within the kind of rhythms of poetry and the person who is transmitting the poetry and keeping it going in, in as part of an oral tradition um and then we we, we get to the, the the kind of athenian moment where where writing has come in and you know the knowledge can be encoded within within styli or and eventually books and so on and that separation happens there it might be worth talking a, a little just a little bit about the um about homer and the, the question of Homer's authorship, because a lot of people won't necessarily know this, that um, 
Homer for, for, for years was personified as a person, the blind poet and so on. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, early part of the 20th century, uh, this character Milman Parry, I'm very interested in, who um, uh, a, 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 a scholar who decided that Homer was actually wasn't necessarily a person, but kind of stood at the end of a long tradition of oral transmission. And you had these characters who were called rhapsodes who uh, would go around all over ancient Greece in the, the kind of um, pre-writing period. And they would know all these these poems they, that, that had been kind of orally transmitted. And he found that there, there was a kind of su um, survival of, of this type of oral culture in Yugoslavia and travelled to Yugoslavia and went to remote inns and met the rhapsodes who would... Uh, who would read, sing their, their 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 kind of tales, which were kind of history and folk memory and legend and myth all rolled into one. They weren't actually the the you know the Odyssey and the Iliad, but they were very similar. And he uh, Milman Parry looked into the way that the, the tricks of memory that were used within the poetry that and found these in Homer as well. These kind of epithetical phrases, like uh, you know the Rosy fingered dawn, yeah. You know the 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 wise Athena, the brave. There's an incredible. Nowadays we read um, translations of Homer; it reads like a prose narrative. But the original was poetry, and it's incredibly repetitious. And this was an aid to memory for the rhapsodes that they would have these little kind of epithetical units that they would string together, and that would help them to 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 kind of memorize. And they, they'd have the musical rhythm, and they'd uh, sing it as much as tell it in accompaniment to a liar. And we have some kind of recordings of Serbo-Croat rhapsodes doing this stuff, and it is quite an extraordinary thing to listen to because it's not music. It's not something you'd have on Spotify. Um, and it's not poetry. It is something else. And that is where that sort of thing is where uh, Homer originates and comes from. And yes. the kind of a, but the moment of Athenian philosophy is kind of in the handover from that culture to a new culture, which is one where... Um, where, where content e exists sort of divorced from a transmitter, from a singer of tales. Is that useful? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And uh, that's what, I mean, Havelock is very much building from Perry's work. And mm. and, uh, and so absolutely. I And yeah, and you see this in... Um, there were, you know, form phrases that were formulas, and there were also kind of types of stories that were formulas that then would get reconfigured, you know. So if you needed to tell another story, you could kind of take this previous story and, you know, mix different bits around. Um, it also touches on something that um, I was maybe going to get to later, which was that... Um, kind of remixing some of these stories, especially myths, was a was a, a general uh, Greek teaching tool. So many of the um, many of the Greek philosophers and, and scientists of the time took the the format of myth as a way to communicate some of their their big ideas. And so uh, you know, Protagoras, when he he wanted to talk about the the nature of man and how they use tools, he took um, the Prometheus as the myth of Prometheus and and added his own bits. And so there was a, a kind of a a process of um, censoring and reconfiguring different um, bits, which which in a way kind of shows maybe as a corrective to to um, maybe a caricature of Havelock's portrait of the oral culture. Um, there, there was always a kind of a dynamism there as well, you know, where people were taking, taking these parts and, and changing them. Um, just to kind of maybe last point about Havelock is that part of what's exciting, I think about Havelock or why I, I was so kind of thrilled when I read it is that this is not, you know, your kind of your standard, like, ideas shaping education, but it's actually education shaping ideas. Um, um, the, the, the kind of the new educational opportunities allowed for the, for these ideas to, to make sense. Um, so 
maybe maybe also before I jump to slavery, um, <laughs> as you do, um, the another idea that was since I, I think you were talking about it, John, about you know the the presence of the teacher, um, something that runs throughout Greek education um, from you know, kind of early discussions of it to, to, to the sophists and on was this idea of association or what they called synusia. Um, and it's, it's just this idea that learning happens through being around the right people. Um, and this is even at the basis of um, Socrates's trial. You know, if you, if you read the trial of Socrates, it's, uh, it hinges on this idea of association because they say that um, Socrates is a horrible person to be associated with. Hmm. Um, and um, in a way, I think the part of what, you know, in Havelock's thesis, there's something that Plato is challenging there about association. Um, but but on a, on a kind of that surface level, you know, it's it's actually not questioned. So, um, Socrates actually talks about the importance of association, and that's why, for example, he he doesn't charge fees because he can have true association with the people he talks to. He can have true synusia when there's no the the barriers of fees is is removed. Um, the so just a quick kind of thing about slavery. Um, you mentioned slavery in the podcast, but I think that uh, I, 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 there's a few things maybe worth saying about slavery and its relation to education. So first, mm -hmm. with Plato, um, it's, it's worth saying that Plato never, he never, Plato never addressed education. He talked about education a lot, but never as an end in itself. It was always an extension of his politics. Um, and... Uh, and, and so the education was to, part of the, how you answered the question of how you made the ideal city state. Yeah. And his politics, as we know, was one that completely accepted slavery and inequality is kind of hardwired into his, his ideal. Um, the, another uh, two, two more points to make. The, the second is that as um, Alfred North Whitehead observed this really beautifully in a book called Adventures of Ideas, that you, you see in, in ancient Greece these, these two parts that are kind of seem to be in conflict, although no one seems to realize it, which is this idea of, of the psyche, of the self, and um, which, which then kind of becomes a Christian idea of the soul. And, and, and then and slavery, and um, which, you know, I, I mean, to Whitehead's mind, there's this kind of inherent dignity, you know, there's inherent kind of um, an inherent, we have a, you know, because someone has a soul, we have a moral responsibility to this person, this person has an inherent dignity. But it's, it's not till, you know, the 1700s, where an, an anti-slavery movement even starts emerging you know, in England, and there's, you know, people that are saying, hey, you know, this is, <laughs> maybe this isn't great. Um, I, the other thing to say, I, I think, maybe the most important point for our purposes, is that partly as a result of this, this culture that was really built on slavery, um, is that we, you know, bracketing the kind of the difficulties of trying to assign, I'm not trying to assign causality, but we inherit a culture that looks down in many ways on, on work. And, um, you know, so, and, and um, they didn't, I mean, they didn't, they didn't respect these slaves. Um, and, and as a result, we have these kind of knock on effects like that maybe in a way, this is part of the reason why Plato looked down on, on empirical approaches, you know, he, you know, to him, um, you know, actually looking at the stars in order to do astronomy, that was, that was, that was kind of cheap. Hmm. You know, the, the real people do it in their heads, you know, 
Um, or, you know, you think of like the Pythagoreans, they, uh, like one of their many weird rules was that if they dropped something, they wouldn't pick it up, you know, and, and, um, they had and a lot I, of weird think, rules, didn't they? Not putting your, yeah, you had to but, put the left sock on before the right sock, or the left shoe on for the right shoe. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and the Pythagoreans were very much of this, um, kind of Platonic mentality too, of not you know, of, of starting with in the mind and, mm. and not the physical world. And um, we have this now, you know, where we still struggle to see often the connection between the world of our hands and of work and learning. You know, um, I did a, a, I used to do a reading group. I've done many reading groups, but I used to do a reading group with um, some, some friends, mostly in universities in London. And, um, we had a one that was organized by uh, Toby. Um, uh, Toby from Filtered. Yeah, Toby from Filtered. Who I think is Toby Harris. Yeah, yeah, Toby Harris. End of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. top chap, uh, Toby. Yeah. He he co co organized a, a reading group session um, where it was a great kind of L and D meets higher ed moment, and it was about the world of work and learning. And he had this piece of research, really fascinating piece of research from the 70s by this guy named Ellen Tuff uh, called Why People Learn. And it was looking at, uh, it, it just was a very simple piece of research where they they interviewed adults about how they learn and, and what they do. And what they found was that most adults would say, you know, when asked about like, what time do you dedicate to learning? They'd say, oh, hardly any, you know, I'm just, you know, my life has moved on since then. And, and then they'd say, well, what do you do? And then they'll say, well, you know, I go to like on Sunday mornings, I go to my Pilates class and then I'm doing a gardening workshop later. And, you know, and, and there would mm -hmm. be like, actually, and then they'd say, oh, and then I'm reading, a, you know, and then I spent the evening reading a book or something, but, but because it's not formalized because it's not in a classroom, um, they don't see those things as learning. Yeah. Um, and it's the same, you know, with, uh, be, you know, being in the workplace, trying new things in the workplace. We don't, we don't make, we don't always make the connection. Um, I think there's probably more just a human condition thing. Maybe, I don't know if it, we can blame it on Plato, but, um, but it's, it's something we deal with. And, and, and then the other thing is, you know, for, for those of us working in universities, we, we, it would feel as if we're inheriting Plato's culture where, we often have to work with people where working with the tools, working with technology is seen as a lower status activity. And um, it's a bit like, I don't know, you know, um, how women in the 50s and 60s, you know, in order to progress in their careers, used to have to say that they didn't know how to type. Mm -hmm. you know, um, th there's like, I think academics feel like if they admit that they know actually, you know, how to build things in the LMS or VLE, then it could be damaging for their career. The Learning Hack podcast is supported by Learning News, the learning sector's newswire. Rob and his team are good friends of the podcast, and we really value the help and advice we've had from them, and they do a great job. For the very latest news from around the learning sector, for interviews with learning leaders, the latest from learning sector vendors and features on workplace learning, go to learningnews.com. So we talked about uh, the, the, the separation of the knower from the known. And this is something that happened, what, was it with the beginning of writing or is it something that comes in with Socrates, Plato. Um, firstly, um, if you answer that, and, and then what what are the implications for education beyond it? So yeah, so I think it's it's happening with uh, a certain language that is mostly being introduced through Socrates and Plato. Um, some could argue that it could be seen in earlier uh, Greek writers like Democritus. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a language of um, of 
the self, and then there's a, a certain kind of philosophical language um, where they talk about the thing in itself, where they're they're trying to kind of kind of you know there's a sort of discourse that you see especially with Socrates, you know, where he's trying to say like you know what is the thing itself, or you know what is justice itself, not just you know and try to separate things out from their exemplars. Um, why, why is all this important? Um, why is this sort of separation of the knower from the known important? And why is Havoc important? I think that there's a few kind of amazing things, like really incredible things that are all going on at the same time. Um, and I'll try to do justice to it. I think first, what, what Havoc is trying to explain is that what Plato was doing and what really the sophist, the kind of the early Greek philosophical movement and the sophists were a part of was, was a huge technological transformation in, in that society. One of the most profound to ever happen where it was transitioning from, from an oral culture to a written culture. Mm -hmm. And to understand that transition and to understand the Homeric culture, to understand the, the, uh, the, the culture, you know, before that time, it, it's really necessary to understand the constraints that are imposed by not having physical recording materials and, and the techniques that were used, the, the, the way they used music, the way they used the, I, this sort of trance-like state to identify uh, with, with the, the verse that was being used. Is all to is, is is an information system. It's all for the memory storage, and uh, when um, the the Greek alphabet was was created and it was being stored on paper, there was all of a sudden space for for people to um, communicate and store information in, in other ways, and there was and there was a kind of a literal space that was created by having information that was was outside of you. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, like the, the kind of the typical thing, I think, especially in the UK, for some reason, maybe because Raymond Williams, who, you know, he wrote mm -hmm. this critique, Marsha McLuhan uh, was British. Um, it, it had more impact here, but, you know, first thing that often people say is this is technological determinism. And I think that even Raymond Williams himself, I think was a, was a, a bit more nuanced than that, but it becomes a kind of a way that people shut down these conversations much to their own detriment because, you know, like it's to, to my mind, like you can't understand really what was going on without this context. And, um, you know, was it necessary? Did it like, did it have to happen? No, but, but to my mind, it's incredibly clear that this this new way of talking about knowledge and truth and information and learning had greater resonance because of the the material supports because of the material conditions because you know the the technologies that were being that were available um and that in an, in an oral culture, yes, you know, like all this stuff could have been said too, but would it have made the same amount of sense? No. And actually this has been, you know, seen actually as in anthropologists that have investigated oral cultures. Um, so, so that's kind of the main kind of headline. I think that the, the other thing to kind of emphasize is that even though, I, I, you know, what Plato's, you know, especially in the Republic, his sort of overarching vision is is political. You know, he's you know in the the Republic, he's trying to describe it's a it's a vision for the ideal city state, and and education is never talked about like as a means in itself. Education was really huge to this whole conversation, and it was ultimately why Socrates was killed was over educational grounds for corrupting the youth. It's what Aristophanes, you know, was was really targeting Socrates for, and 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 through Socrates, the rest of the sophist 
philosopher educators um, was that was was the way that they educated and part of what they did that was so controversial is that they is that they opened up education mm. um, they opened up education beyond the aristocracy and um you know and and you know people like aristophanes aristophanes was a conservative aristophanes was a traditionalist and people like him and and pindar would argue that it, it's only ever appropriate to teach arete or to teach justice to the aristocracy this is you know you can't you can't make to them the process of education was the process of itself of making someone noble and so um or you know bringing out in a sense what was already there whereas um uh, socrates is is presenting a very radical solution by saying not only that can anyone learn anything but that um and this is where it's like it's really extreme um is he said like i don't even teach anyone anything he says that i don't teach mm -hmm. um and when and no one can teach anyone anything that's what really like if you if you read the uh the republic of plato like what socrates says in it like the main what he summarizes the message of the allegory of the cave as being he, when he sums it up it's not about the the troubles of the enlightened it's a it's it's about the process of education that's what he says the, he summarized the main point as being is that some people think that education is a process whereby a teacher gives information or gives truth i forget whether where they use to another person when really education is the process of directing someone's body at at the light okay um and uh and so it's a it's a very radical vision of like the 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 possibility that anyone can learn and and just as um you know this idea of the soul it has the seeds of like a radical idea of uh, equality between human beings, the, this idea of learning, whatever the kind of um, questions you might have. I mean, I don't believe in the doctrine of recollection and the eternity of the soul, which is what it's based on, but, but what it's achieving, I 100% believe in and am inspired by, which is that, is that anybody can learn anything. And ultimately anyone could get in a position where they can teach anything. Yeah. So it's a drawing out. Could I, just to kind of establish one thing about the, the death of Socrates, yeah. what, what was his crime? Because he, his crime was uh, corrupting the youth. I think we yeah. kind of get confused about this because um, Socrates liked to hang around with young boys and we have an imperfect, I think, understanding of, of the, the Greek idea of sex. It's very different and of homosexuality and so on. When when they said that he was corrupting the youth, was it, did they just mean he was a dirty old man who who liked young boys? Or is it more to do with uh, something social and political about his ideas of what education meant? Was it because yeah, he was, well, yeah, absolutely. a disruptive so, force in his hands? Is, is that it? Yeah, so it's, it's tied to um, he... There was the the accusation of impiety, so you know that he was questioning the the civic religion, which is why, for example, people say that Plato was very careful to involve civic religion in um, in his academy, okay. you know, because he didn't want to um, suffer the, the same way as Socrates. Um, the uh, and this is also something that Aristophanes picks up on is the is um socrates's atheism his his critique of the of the gods um and that's what even the clouds is about like why they call the the play the clouds is because because he says you know like look you know the lightning doesn't strike down when people tell lies lightning just comes from clouds when they're mm -hmm. when they're storming um and and then, you know, there's also people who would argue that this was also to do with some bigger, you know, broader political changes. But what Havelock would say is that his real crime or the real way that he corrupted the youth 
is that he questioned the poet. And in so doing, he broke the spell. Um, he broke the spell because, you know, when, when they were saying, you know, these beautiful words, he ruined it by saying, okay, this bit, you know, this bit where you say just, or this bit where you say, you know, good, what do you, what do you mean by that? And it just, it, it broke the spell, the, 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 the kind of enchantment that this created was, was broken by by his asking these questions and that spell um, being uh, an integral part of oral transmission it, yes that what you're yeah saying? absolutely yeah so and, so the kind of enchantment, that sense of enchantment was one yeah. of the in a sense the the old technology that was part of the old technology that that held the whole thing together yeah so it's as if he there's actually a funny example of this yep. um where uh funny to think it's almost 20 years old now. I remember my brother telling me about it, where um, it took uh, the lyrics from Notorious B.I.G.'s uh, One More Chance, and it had the, you know, like the the literal translation of, of what he is saying. And um, uh, yeah, it just ruins it. It just completely ruins the song. Um, and... Uh, yeah, in a, in a funny way, that's what what Homer was, or excuse me, what Socrates was was doing to Homer and others. Okay, so it's it's as if in the middle of a Dawes concert, um, the philosopher had jumped onto the stage, taken the microphone away from Jim Morrison, and said, "What exactly do you mean by the end?" Is this uh, yeah exactly uh, exactly they started getting all kind of yeah. intellectual and left brain in the middle of a, a, this kind of um, hieratic um, incantatory sort of mystical uh, communal experience? Am, am I explaining that at all? <laughs> totally, <laughs> yeah. totally. Yeah, I mean, okay. we'd have to recreate the scene or something. Yeah, but like, yeah. Then, and yeah, younger people really, might, yeah, of, might not know who the doors are. So he was a big, a in a way, it's like, yeah, he was the big party pooper, you know, who just like ruined the fun almost. But Interesting. that, I, I think it was amazing, you know, because it, 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 it shows, I, I guess on one hand, you know, this sort of possibility for, for any of us, you know, to, um, to change and and to learn and and to become better people, and then it and I and I think it also it, it really illustrates how how um, actually like technology and and I guess cultural processes can can interact in a way that um, creates like profound change and and so some of those ideas they I guess they they set the seed for like great equality, but they also were ideas that made th these, these big changes that were already happening make sense. In season five, we covered the German idealists, uh, Kant, Herbert, Hegel, Humboldt. Uh, now you've got things to say on the subject, Humboldt and whether and how he had an influence. Uh, you want to talk about Lernfreiheit, which is learning freedom, uh, Lehrung und Forschung, teaching and research, Bildung, culture, um, and then Dilthi, that's a, a name, not a concept, and the humanities. Uh, and there's a, a, a long German word there, which I will mispronounce now. Yeah, it sounds like one of those German uh, words for a, a particular railway ticket that <laughs> is longer than the name of a village in Wales. Yeah, Geistisch Wissenschaften, yeah, and Hegel and recognition. Um, again, a lot. If you've survived the first half uh, about the Greeks, um, buckle in. <laughs> There's a lot here. I don't know if we can fit it all in, but let's dive in and see how we get on. Uh, give yeah. us your hot take on Humboldt. Well, maybe move a bit faster. So the, okay. I guess the first thing to say about Humboldt is that um, Humboldt is a, a very, very paradoxical figure. His place in history is, is very paradoxical. Um, in many ways now, Alexander von Humboldt is, 
is, is a very obscure figure. Um, not many people know about him. But in the 19th century, he was one of the most famous people in the world. He was, he was huge. He, uh, I, I don't think Donald mentioned this, that he has, there's over 300 things named after him, animals, phenomena, places. Um, they were going to name the state of Nevada Humboldt at one point. Wow. Um, they do have in California Humboldt County, which I think is like the lead capital of America, but um, not don't think Humboldt's got anything to do with that, but he uh, he spent. I, I, I guess th that's the the first paradox. The second paradox is he spent a huge amount of time as a government and uni university administrator, but much of his his work and writing is is profoundly anti bureaucratic, and his idea of the the university is as a kind of antidote to to um this kind of looming bureaucracy and this uh increasing kind of um, movement towards turning people into machines um and i i think the the third paradox is that um he is in our own time uh, among people like us really famous for one thing uh that he is associated really identified with um the birth of the modern research university uh particularly the kind of the german style research university but maybe that's not correct because yeah. that that is the kind of our idea of uh to re yeah to recapitulate a, a point that came up in the great minds on learning episode uh we're blaming him for or attributing to him the fact that um, we have universities that combine teaching with research. Yes. And that sort of be going back to Humboldt, yeah. But then the, the kind of the strange paradox, final paradox, is that um, in Germany itself, um, at least on the, the level of discourse, his influence is hard to find. So um, there's a book, actually have it, Right here, it's uh, by this guy Johann Rostling, um, uh, Humboldt in the, the modern German university, where you know he goes through rector's speeches, through you know policy documents, uh, at least in the you know the twentieth century, and Humboldt's nowhere to be found. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, what does that mean? I don't know. Um, I'm not totally sure. Uh, you know, was it that I think you know when we when we think about the what happened in Prussia and and other German states at the time, uh, this birth of a modern research university. Um, maybe we have to look beyond Humboldt to some extent, you know, and and look at the the role of things like the government funding and and how um, this was really a, a state project. Um, I think that you have to look to maybe other other people, um, you know, other other voices at, at the time as, as well. Um, and, uh, and I think that maybe the other thing, like kind of my final thought about Humboldt is that we have to maybe, maybe we can think of Humboldt as, as not just a, you know, this kind of event in the past, but, but as a dialogue partner for the future, you know, there's so many things that when you, when you hear Humboldt's ideas and you read him that speak completely to our experience now, the importance of, um, of freedom, you know, was, was a big thing for him or Lehrenfreiheit. So he, you know, the, he was a great promoter of choice for students. And, um, and, and so, you know, students at that time weren't in a kind of a set university students didn't have a set curriculum. They could take whatever they wanted. And um, I think there's obviously costs that come with that too, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, um, but this idea of, you know, giving students, uh, you know, ownership, you know, of, of their own learning, I think is, is so critical. And, and, the and to, overall, follow their, to follow their own interest rather than. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and to kind of build something, you know, based on the questions that they're asking. Um, 
And then also, you know, this idea of, I mean, because the, the whole thing, like, you know, way, you know, for Plato, like education came out of his politics. And I think for Humboldt, education came out of a certain idea of a person and of a, a, his anthropology, as it were, and, and what, you know, what makes a, a fulfilled person. And, um, you know, he, he talked about self-activity, um, self-actus. And um, and it's the same with the word building. Like building is in German, a, it's like a, a reflexive uh, verb, you know. So you're zick building, or you're you're educating yourself. Okay. Um, or I think that's how it typically works. I'm not expert, but um, but it's this idea of yeah, self activity and being well rounded. You know, having you know a kind of a, a, a kind of a broader kind of development where you're you're interested in you know in art and and culture and um so anyway that's that's humble um do we have time to talk about quickly about diltai and um recognition diltai, that's how you pronounce it yeah just just quickly my um uh humboldt story uh when we i was recently at the uh online educa berlin um conference in berlin where i met you last in, in the yeah first. yeah uh, I was walking down the street towards the uh, the place, and I came upon this statue. It was a statue of Humboldt. And I thought, great, I can take a photograph of this and do a whole LinkedIn post about here we are. We covered him in Great Minds on Learning, and now here I am at the, the learning conference, how it all ties in. Unfortunately, when I looked a bit more closely at the photograph, I realized it was his brother. Yeah, oh, who, cool. Who's the naturalist. Yeah, because, you know. Because um, it's very close to the um, the zoological gardens. Yeah, because um, apparently, you know, the... Uh, the University of Humboldt is named after both of them. Oh, I didn't know that. No. Yeah, yeah, it's the um, Alexander and his his brother. Yeah. Okay, so uh, um, Dilthi, I'm reading. Dil yeah, I Diltai. I guess the one thing Diltai. I just wanted to say about Diltai that interests me, and and in, in a way, this is kind of how our picture of the modern research university might need a kind of broader portrait. Is that mm -hmm. he? Um, writes about the Geisteswissenschaft and then you know that which is like translates to the humanities um or that's the word that okay. they use for the humanities and and its difference from the sciences and and the way that he characterized it, characterizes it he was also a german romanticist as well and um is that is that the, the purpose of the humanities is is for stand or the understanding of great minds of, of, of geists, of great geists. And I think what's maybe worth emphasizing here is that is that there was a kind of a special moment in the history of interpretation that was was happening at that time in romantic hermeneutics where what understanding meant was almost like a kind of getting into somebody else's head, you know, is like feeling and experiencing and thinking the way that person did. Mm -hmm. And um and you know Hermenots, you know, or hist historians of uh, interpretation would emphasize that this was a unique moment, you know, like, so before that interpreting a text was about the text. And then after that interpreting a text was about the text. But in this kind of one moment, it was like very, very author centered. And I, I guess I always think, and this was my whole thought about Diltai is that maybe this is the, like the linchpin, the implicit linchpin of of forschung and und Lehrung, you know, that like the, the way that, because we know that like, um, <laughs> you know, people, people have done lots of meta-analyses and analyses and meta-analyses of the relationship between teaching and research and, and the, the effect is zero, right? Like it's not a positive effect. It's not a negative effect. It's just no effect. Research mm -hmm. does not make people better teachers doesn't make them worse, but it doesn't make them better. And so, you know, in terms of opportunity cost, it's doesn't, it's not a good look. Um, but what, um, what maybe is, is really sort of underneath it, I think what's maybe truly underneath it for, for all of us is this kind of almost idea of, of connecting with great minds and of connecting. And this is why even like the lecture at the time, you know, the lecture was, proof of genius you know mm -hmm. um it was like it was why people went to see hegel 
you know, give a lecture. It was because Hegel was a genius and you wanted to witness it. And, um, and so anyway, I, that's my whole kind of whatever, you know, little random thought about Del Tai. Um, yeah, but, it, but it's interesting, isn't it? We have this concept of kind of sitting at the feet, so to speak, is that actually to be in the presence, um, you know, and I have a friend who studied psychology at university and um, she met Anna Freud and, and it was a story she told for the rest of her life that she had kind of had that physical contact with the Freud family. Absolutely, you know, and I think that that's maybe part of you were talking about cultishness and education and and i think this is maybe part of it you know and it's why people want to touch the hem of jesus's garment as it were you know and and have have those moments you know and i mean i think of like i i had a moment where when i lived in new york i um i was uh really good friends with this retired philosophy professor from mit named john mcneese and um john mcneese was a very good friend of um, what's his name? Who did a, the Thin Red Line? Uh, oh, Days of Heaven. Yes, not Malik. Yeah, Malik. Terrence, Terrence Malik. Malik. Yeah. Terrence Malik is also from a philosophy background, for what it's worth. Probably one of many reasons why he's such uh. an excellent director. And um, anyway, in, in kind of my weird New York life, I we all went out to the movies. You know, he and my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and Terrence Malick and and John McNeese and I and and then afterwards we chatted and um but you know but like I guess my point is is that um and I made my brother really jealous who's a big movie fan but like what's brilliant about John McNeese is experienced in watching you know Days of Heaven mm. you know that's that's where his genius sits if you just um you know go and see a movie and like i mean we, we had a fascinating dis discussion afterwards but you know that's that's not how genius is really touched anyway um it it's an interesting it, thing though when, because it isn't there a difference between okay there, there's a great artist who you admire um and they say you should never meet your heroes and then you meet that that person you you love their records or their books whatever and you have a conversation with them and it's banal and you think, well, how could this person have created this amazing thing? They're just, this is just an ordinary well, in a man way, or an actually, ordinary this, woman. This is, is really that beautiful. The same, is that the same as a relationship with a, a great teacher when you meet that person and they don't have anything to say to you? You'd expect that the teacher actually had a bit more to convey because the artistic process of creation is they make stuff. What a great teacher does, it might be they write great books, but aren't they supposed to be passing stuff on in person as well? Is there a difference? This is this is really beautiful, John, because this brings us back to Plato and ah. Plato's symposium. And uh, there is um, a moment, you know, where, um, you know, in the symposium, it's meant to be this kind of feast and they've invited all the, you know, the great and good, you know, famous philosophers of the time and playwrights to talk about love. And, um, and people give these different speeches. There's some speeches that are meant to be kind of taking the piss like out of other people. And, and it's got all kinds of moments in it. It's an amazing uh, yeah. piece of literature that everybody should read. But there's this one moment that's like the most brilliant moment in the whole thing. And it's where uh, Alcibiades, who's a young uh, actor appears and he's he's young and he's beautiful but he's not like meant to be the cleverest chap and he, he says um he he tells the story of trying to sleep with socrates like trying to get socrates to sleep with him and he says that socrates is like a statue with a gem inside which was a thing apparently in in ancient greece you know you'd have these i forget the greek term for it but you know it's like and and it's you know it, it's like there's this this idea that you know you're seeing the surface but there's like there's something there there's something there's this special kernel you know or Slava Zizak would talk about you know the kinder egg or something you know yeah. there's this there's the, there's the surprise you know there's the surprise in the kinder egg somehow there even though you can't see it 
And yeah, I mean, it's a big part of the the education experience is, you know. So look, what's, he, what's his point people. about Alcibiades? Uh, Alcibiade, what is his point about uh, Socrates from from that metaphor? The, Let's make it really obvious. I, I think it's about maybe the. I think it's about he's trying to explain why this beautiful man was attracted to this ugly man, and um, and in a way maybe the 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 like the impossibility, you know, to put it in a kind of French philosophy sounding way there's a kind of this impossibility of the situation you know that he's trying to get something that in a way maybe he he can never get so you never quite get the the inside of the kinder egg the little plastic thing that you can assemble as an ambulance or, or whatever yeah but but then you know no one ever gives up in yeah, life, yeah you know trying to trying to do this The last thing is is about recognition, so um, <clears throat> or honor canon, and uh, this is um, a really kind of interesting and important piece of of Hegel. So you know when people talk about Hegel, um, you know they tend to talk about the dialectic and this sort of the the unity of opposites and um, this idea of inherent contradictions, but um, the, the other part of Hegel, you know, another kind of the key piece is this idea of recognition. And um, it's particularly something that was taken up by the French Hegelians, um, particularly a guy named Kojev, who um, really, if you, if you want to understand most modern French philosophy, he's the kind of secret underwriter of, of a lot of it. So he was a, a huge influence on, Kojev was an influence on Sartre, on, on Lacan, Derrida, uh, Foucault, Merleau-Ponty. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, if you took like a French philosophy course, he would not be uh, discussed. He was a, a white Russian. Yeah. You know, he, he fled, um, he was part of an aristocratic Russian family, you know, that fled during the revolution. How are you so, spelling that name? I'm going to have to look this up. It's K-O-J-E-V-E. -E. I think his, you know, originally his name was like Kojenikov. Or, okay. And he but, fr francicized it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And he uh, really had a, he had a, a book called, and a, based on his lectures, um, called An Introduction to the Reading of Hegel. Where, which really centered on, on recognition, and um, and the the master slave dialectic, which is part of Hegel's way of um, trying to explain uh, the, uh, uh, the the struggle for recognition. So, briefly, the the master slave dialectic is this kind of proto historical moment. You know where you have these two people who are who are start off equal, and they're this kind of fight for for uh, status. And um, one eventually wins, and and enslaves the other one. You know, so in this fight for recognition, you know, he can't if he kills the other one, that's no good because you you, you can't get any recognition from a dead person. So yeah. so the victor. In, enslaves the other one but then the and so you have a master and servant or master and slave but the the trouble is that the master finds that the the recognition that this person gets from the slave isn't of value to them anymore because they're this lower status person and then the the slave by by being forced to do work actually gets their own kind of different kind of recognition and and um, in in working with nature and being able to transform nature hegel says and kojev um, that this person recognizes that they're that they're free and and so also in hegel this is very difficult to understand frankly part of hegel but but this idea of recognition is is also tied to freedom for hegel so um, free will or freedom is is almost like a kind of socially constructed 
thing. Like, you know, people are free because they are around other people who see them as free. And so this also helps you to, um, or, you know, explains um, Sartre, like when Sartre talks about the gaze, um, Sartre says, you know, this other person looks at me and I become an object to this other person. And in so doing, Sartre says, like, I lose my freedom. You know, it's like, well, why do you lose your freedom? It, well, it traces back to this idea from, from Hegel. Anyway, um, this is, this really kind of, to my mind, this idea of recognition is, is a, it's a kind of a metaphor, but it has a huge amount of explaining power for, for education and for life. You know, it's this, this battle for recognition and why, why do we want, why do we want recognition from, um, people that we see as above us, you know, or higher than us? And why do we not care about recognition from people we see as, as, as below us? It, it explains why, like my son, my son is 12 and he's got a bunch of uh, WhatsApp groups that he's on with his friends. And all they do is roast each other. You know, yeah. they, he was part of the, actually he's in a, he's in a rugby club where very London, nice London experience where, like each of the six nations is represented in the rugby club. So mm. all the different kids were rooting for different countries. Yeah. And my son showed me his WhatsApp chat. And it just, it was just a string of uh, bubbles saying, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Um, you know, and, and like, and you know, the kids are just like, I don't, I mean, it sort of worries me a bit. Maybe I'm, maybe I need to pull them off of it. You're, sure like, you're not, you know, this isn't the breeding ground for toxic masculinity here. Yeah, yeah. But it's also, you know, what would Hegel say? This is the battle for recognition, you know, where yeah. they, they're in this, this double bind because they, um, they want to destroy each other, but then they need each other. Mm. To come back yeah. to the, uh, the way that you described the master-slave thing in Hegel, yeah. um, it, you know, on the face of it, it sounds a little bit like the, 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 the plot summary of A Star is Born, except at the end where the slave or the person who's kind of on the way down recognizes that they're free yeah i didn't quite get that bit now how do we relate that to modern education and training perhaps you well can the, wind i it think that the free bit to, the yeah. freedom is that they they can they can they get to experience their agency like through the work you know the work right. the work recognizes them um how does this um how does this uh, uh you know come into education i think that Self-determination theory is the kind of the main thing that, you know, when people talk about yeah. uh, motivation and in, in learning and, um, you know, so it's uh, autonomy. People talk about autonomy, relatedness and, and mastery. Yeah. This but, is ringing a bell from an earlier episode of Great Minds on Learning. I'm yeah. To go back um, to, okay. But in a way, like they all kind of in a way, I don't, maybe I've just been Hegelianized, but like I, what I see in in all of those is is a kind of recognition, you know, that like people are they're getting recognition from the work, you know, from like the, this experience of mastery of getting better at something, and then they're getting, and then they're and then they're you know in the kind of they're they're experiencing that recognition interpersonally where you know, people are seeing them differently when, you know, they can talk about something fluently, they can see, they can see you doing something um, better. And, um, and in a way, you know, autonomy as well is, a, is itself a kind of um, type of recognition that would be very resonant, you know, for, for Hegelians. Um, you know, again, because of this tie of, of uh, freedom and recognition. And, and also, you know, it's, um, I guess, you know, tied to love, you know, or, or again, to go back to the symposium in Plato, you know, that, yeah. that Kojev would say that desire, desire is always desire for the other's desire. Um, so, you know, what, what we want is, you know, we don't, we want our, partner or you know whoever not just as an object but as a subject we want them to want us we want it's a desire for mutuality yeah this is reminding me of uh 
Rene Girard, who says that we don't, that we, what we desire is what somebody else desires, that other people mediate our desire. They give us, we, because a human being is, is a desiring creature that doesn't know what to desire, basically. So we get everything from kind of advertising from Twitter. That's where we get all our desire, desires from. Um, and it's always a triangle, desire is always a triangular relationship, he says. It, it just reminded me of that. We need to move on now to, uh, th thanks for all the stuff about the, the, the Germans. That's really interesting because there, there's a side of Hegel you brought in, up there, which I don't think we covered very much in Great Minds on Learning and our bit on Hegel. We we talked about other stuff with him and it's really good to to have that put in. Um, and talking of Great Minds on Learning, you know, bringing it back to me, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of what Donald and I are going to be covering the upcoming season now with um just get your comments on this. I think we're starting with leadership, uh, which would be Burns, Drucker, Kellerman, Pfeffer. Might be someone of talking about motivation in there. Uh, then we do the invention of writing. So we'll be going back to this thing about kind of um, Homer um, and earlier to the to the invention of writing in the various places where it emerged in um, Samaria and China, wherever, and what that did for learning. We'll be doing psychoanalysts. So that's coming up to really the 20th century, including Freud, of course, and Klein, Erickson, Rogers. And then we'll be doing continental theorists, uh, Heidegger, Foucault, Lyotard, Derrida, Foucault. So it's interesting how this conversation has touched a lot of those bases. Um, and we'll have a QA, Q and a session for one of those. So overall, how, do, how, how does that sound? What hopes and fears would you have for how we might treat those topics? In uh, well, you know, leadership, I can't wait to hear. I mean, we all know Donald, Donald Clark's take on leadership, and I'm sure that'll be fun to to hear that. Um, just a random kind of point about Drucker. He, he wrote a fantastic autobiography. You know, whatever you think about Drucker, I mean, and I think he's very clever, but his autobiography is describing his life in Vienna at the time really remarkable and he has actually nice segue into psychoanalysis because he had a really interesting take on freud because he grew up with him you know he grew up in vienna at the time oh, that, right. um, freud was emerging um and, and he has his kind of biz sets his business management mindset to freud so I'll, that's all i'll say about that but um the, knowing donald he probably knows about it already um about psychoanalysis i know Again, like, uh, I don't think Donald Clark is in any way a fan, but, oh, totally. um, no. but, you know, I guess I just like, I, I am, you know, and I don't know, it's a bit like, whatever, like I like, I'm not a car person, but like, I think that like old Vovos are beautiful, but like, it doesn't mean, you know, like, it doesn't mean that I, I want to buy one. I don't want to drive one, but mm. I still think that they're like super cool. You can admire things and not, um, agree with them or you know buy into them i would have liked to see some discussion of lacan i'm a big lacan fan but that, that would probably be too much um the not sure he talks that much about learning does he well he he does in a way you know he talks about he has a concept of university discourse and i would hope he'd talk about transference transference is a really important idea um also um the subject's supposed to know and also actually one of the, yeah, I mean, this is part of transference, but what Lacan calls the imaginary versus what he calls the symbolic or real. And it's very tied to his critique of American psychoanalysis. This is Lacan, um, where he saw in American psychoanalysis, you know, there was a move where, you know, Freud famously would sit on the couch and not look at the subject. He just, he just listened to them. And mm. so the, the locus of psychoanalysis, as it were, was was the words, was the speech, and American psychoanalysis turned that around, and it became an American style me, you know, looking at you, and 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 became very relational. All of a sudden, it became about you know role modeling and and this kind of uh, kind of trying to leverage transference and countertransference. Whereas um, Lacan was saying that you know the 
real psychoanalysis is, is, is about words and it's about language and it's, he was using the kind of the French structural linguistics at the time to, to try to unpack that. And in a way, I, I think that there is a certain resonance for, for what we do in, 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 you know, in learning where um, there is this kind of, uh, that struggle again, that, you know, we're talking about in the symposium of that there is a, there are relationships but there's always something that um, is decoupled from the relationship and that where, you know, truth and knowledge can, can be set free and, and, and have its own life. Um, I think that sounds really probably recherche and abstract, but that that's, I just, wanted to share that no, that that's very you, interesting and it's you're being, you're being, podcasting you're, as well of course podcasting being a medium of the, the yeah yeah the absolutely podcast. yeah and you know and donald is, has talked about some of the research around the 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 superior in some cases superior effects of audio only mm. and and some of this comes down to the face you know to the which is the, an incredibly french and psychoanalytic motif you know, and, and that, that like, and it's also why, you know, some um, simulated learning can work better is that we're not spending this time looking at each other's faces, looking for something that isn't there. And that's a completely Lacanian kind of, again, theme. Um, about continental philosophy, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm super excited. I mean, Heidegger, whatever you think, Heidegger was an awful person. And I think history is discovering that it's like, we thought he was bad. Turns out he was he, he was worse. He was a complete dickhead. Like, sorry, I, I can't, I can't think of a better word. He was awful. You know, like slept with like loads and loads of students. Um, you know, was a, was a, a, a Nazi as we all know, but was yeah. also just a bully. Was just a, a just a pretty nasty character. But he, I think, many people would argue, many people that I respect would argue that he was one of the most important minds of the 20th century. And as Graham Harlan puts it, you know, his ideas can't be unseen. You know, once once you kind of are aware of them. Uh, they, they, Which is comes back to that thing of you can learn good things from bad people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Thanks for, for the, those reflections, and they will guide us as we um, put that next season together, I'm sure. So lastly, we've been talking largely about figures from history, um, uh, some of them from more recent than others. Who among the living do you follow at the moment and look up to and look out for? I'm really interested in this one because you've, you've kind of covered such a wide, you know, so many bases, such a a, a, a wide spectrum of, of of people in the discussion so far you've brought up. But who is around at the moment that you? Well, there's two talking? people that are recently passed that I'm, I want to mention that I've always been a great admirer of, and they'll they'll actually relate to a lot of what you're going to be talking about in your next episodes and. So the first is Friedrich Kittler, who is a, a German theorist, taught actually at the University of Berlin, I think, mm -hmm. um, when he was alive, died maybe five years ago. He was a kind of a post-structural media theorist who wrote, to my mind, beautiful books about the history of technology. Mm -hmm. And um, the second is Bruno Latour, who died, I think, just two years ago now. And I was a latecomer. To Bruno Latour, I don't know why. It's like a great regret in my life that I didn't read him sooner. But he's delightful. He's a he's an incredibly brilliant and subtle and encyclopedic theorist and anthropologist. And um, he's he's fun and he's funny and um, and he's completely maverick, you know, in his approach. He's he called himself the only French pragmatist. Um, and so, you know, he's not, it's not your typical French theory, Bruno Latour, he's bringing in a lot of cool other stuff like Whitehead, for example, and, and William James. Hmm. And um, I think that if you want to understand technology, I think Bruno Latour, you know, from a conceptual philosophical standpoint, he's one of the places to start. The last person, someone who is actually alive, uh, Graham Harmon, 
is a is an absolutely brilliant shining star of contemporary philosophy. He's Graham Harmon. Yeah. Graham Harmon, yeah. He's he's clear. He's um he's a kind of a Latourian. He he wrote his PhD on uh on Heidegger and did a lot of work on around uh Heidegger's philosophy of technology, but um has kind of expanded out since and he's 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 just incredible. He's a very humble guy, he's a very clear writer. Um and yeah, you sh you should have me on, John, and we'll do a, a philosophy of technology thing. Or I, I don't know, maybe not. I shouldn't say that on a podcast. That's like, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> you're welcome. No, um, it'd be great to have you back. I've I've really enjoyed yeah. this. I, I hope so. I feel like maybe after yeah. this, this will be <laughs> this will be the last time you you'll invite me on because it. Uh, I'm sure I didn't it think I was going to talk time. this much, but it's what I always well, do. you know, I've, it, it's longer than the one than than what we normally do. Um, uh, listening to Lex Friedman's podcast has kind of reset my um, my, my 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 kind of scale in terms of what a long podcast is. I just listened to a four-hour podcast you did on Gaza, but um, so we we've just had a kind of mere hour and a half, I think, so which which I think is great, and we may edit it down a bit. We may not. I, I just thought it was really interesting. Thanks a lot for doing it today. Oh, it's been a pleasure, John. Um, I look forward to the next time. Yeah, but yeah, last time, you know, I have to say, last time I did it, I love the podcast, but I also loved our chat afterwards. Um, no. And we talked about uh, John Le Carre and um, Hemingway and uh, Hemingway versus Fitzgerald. And Oh, uh, yeah, Hemingway, that old Hemingway versus Fitzgerald. Yeah, nice. yeah. That's about my level, you know. So um. <laughs> That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guest and to our sponsors. The Learning Hack is among the top 5% most listened to podcasts globally, according to Listen Notes, we found out.